have I ever advised anyone not to crowdfund? Yes. Um, not to say that they won't be successful in crowdfunding at all, but they aren't ready yet. I mean, the biggest question is, how much do you think I can raise? I don't know, how big is your online audience? Because you're going to need them in order to raise money. So if you have never stepped foot into the online space, you really don't know how that Twitter thing works, or you don't even have your own personal profile on Facebook, it's whoa okay you're not even close to being ready to start a kickstarter campaign first you need to get that first you need to get that piece going first you need to be used to connecting with an audience i'm not saying you need millions of people but you need a, a core group of people um, because those are the ones who are going to help you to spread out you're not going to be able to spread word of mouth all by yourself you're going to have to have a group of people to do that and it's going to be dependent on how active those people are and how many are they as to how much money you can raise you know and and there is no figure if you have 5,000 followers you should be ra able to raise thirty thousand dollars I no, I don't know there are people who have 5,000 followers and only a hundred people gave money so 30,000 is not going to, you know, if they give $10 a piece, you're going to get a couple thousand, <laughs> you know, you're not, there's also a huge correlation between the number of people who are lurkers and the people who actually will take money out of their wallet and give it to you. And in presentations that I give, I show Freddie Wong as an example. He's, you know, on YouTube and has raised two times um, on, on Kickstarter, significant amounts of money but if you look at how many follow uh, subscribers Freddie Wong has on his YouTube channel it's 4.7 million subscribers so you would think oh he can raise millions only 10,000 of those people gave money in any degree in his last Kickstarter so it was very lot less than what he has as his followers so we were talking about um, in this these recent Canadian workshops the 99 one rule which Julie Giles talks about she's from Green Hat Digital and she said 90% of your following are lurkers they're people who are just watching they never participate they've clicked your page and of like and they've never come back or they just see you in the newsfeed and they never do anything about it 9% of those people will retweet you will put a thumbs up next to a comment or leave a comment um, but they're not tight to you you know they they participate but they're not they aren't going to convert only one percent of your super core hardcore fans will ever do anything to help you that actually actively spread the word support everything you do pay money to go to your events show up if you have a meet up that kind of thing so when you're looking at your stats online and you think that all those 5,000 people are a sale you'll be very disappointed when it when push comes to shove about how many people actually pony up for the money so I would say that if you haven't even gotten started no no kind of uh, crowdfunding effort should be started um, if you have gotten started you're gonna have to be realistic it's better to go over your goal than it is to not make your goal um, so set it realistically you know how much do you really need to do what it is and is is that the main goal behind this campaign is it to raise money or is it mainly to to build an audience to to build up that participation and, and money's nice but that's not the main idea behind this effort is to to grow beyond your core because a campaign like that usually helps you to to get more people beyond the the people that you're already engaged with because they help you and there's an impetus to it because there's a deadline <laughs> as opposed to constantly saying hey you know retweet my stuff hey share my stuff you know that that's just kind of an arbitrary effort if you have a campaign where there's a deadline and you're all working towards some kind of you know goal then there's reason to activate those people in a certain time frame and that's what a campaign is you know it's it's a limited amount of time that you're doing some effort um, if if money is your only thing then you're going to have to be careful about how much you're asking to raise because it depends on how helpful the audience that you already have is going to be to you i thought about it um i felt i feel to is successful. I, I really believe in crowdfunding in a lot of ways. I feel for it to be most successful, you need to have the support of everyone involved. And for me, David's been like beyond supportive, like overwhelmingly supportive of the project. But he wasn't a producer on the film. Um, he, you know, he would say this too. He's not. He wasn't interested in the process. He wanted to let me go make it. And I sort of felt to run a successful crowdsourcing campaign for it. 
it would have needed his in involvement. Because I felt it would have been sort of disingenuine to be, the way to run a successful campaign would have been like, hey, Sedaris fans, do you want to see a Sedaris movie? And it felt, would have sort of, I didn't feel comfortable asking him. Maybe he would have helped me and done a video. I'm not sure. But I didn't, it felt wrong to ask him, you know, for me. And I felt without his support, it felt sort of wrong to run a campaign for it. Now that there's a finished film, if it had, we, you know, we've closed distribution. So, I, but if I was doing a self-distribution, I would consider it now that there's a finished film. And now that I have interviews with David and elements I can use um, with his permission, of course, but but I feel like it's each each project's its own, and some projects are meant to be crowdfunded, and, and this one just wasn't wasn't one of them. I didn't feel like I could engage the community in the right way, and also we had some actors attached, but they ended up not being the actors in the final film, and I felt like we would have needed to utilize them, but I felt uncomfortable with that because I didn't have a working relationship with them yet, and they were, you know, slightly bigger names than what ended up in the movie, just by the nature of whoever, at the time I cast them, they weren't bigger names, and they got bigger names and got too busy to be in the film, and I ended up with a cast I could have only dreamed of having anyway, so I'm, I'm thrilled about that, but it felt strange to bring them involved. It just didn't feel like I could do it the right way. And I feel like when I look at the really successful crowd, crowd campaigns, sure, there's some outliers that go into the three and $400,000, but I really feel like the most ambitious you really should get, you know, is it, it, to expect is at the most, you know, 100. You know, I feel like even the Canyons, I think they ended up going to like 130, but you have Paul Schrader and Brett Easton Ellis who each have massive, loyal, decades long fan bases. And even then, they pushed a lot on that campaign, and, you know, they hit, which is an incredible amount of money, but that still wasn't enough for me to make the film. So I also felt uncomfortable going out there and being like, give me $100,000 and maybe I'll be able to find the other however much we need. It, it, it just felt wrong for this project, but I hope I can do something one day that I can make cheaply enough. You know, this movie had to be shot on location, it had 30 speaking parts, it had, you know, a different location every day, all exteriors, it just had things that naturally made it expensive. Um, and, uh, but I hope to do something. If I did something small, if I did a, a movie I could shoot on my own and with minimal crew and minimal locations and here in Los Angeles, I would, I would totally consider I'm um, doing crowdsourcing that way. So, here's the deal. Everybody that I talked to about crowdfunding, right, said it's called crowdfunding. I, my assertion is that it should be called something else. Because everybody thinks that the maximum benefit of crowdfunding is, of course, funding, right? Get your money. And that's true. That's a benefit, and it's a big benefit, and it's important, right? But there's also a wholly unappreciated sort of dynamic that happens when you crowdfund. Okay, backing up, the old way, the old way of distributing, the old way of raising money before crowdfunding existed, you know, thousands of days ago, right, was uh, you would have two ways that you could get an audience to raise their hand that they're a fan of yours, right? There was buy the DVD, well, we're talking about films now, okay? They'd either buy the DVD or go to the theater, right? And in those two ways, uh, it was binary in themselves of whether they would raise their hand. They would either buy it or they would not buy it. So you would make your film for two years, right? And you might tell your audience that uh, it's coming. There's going to be a way you can help us out just when the DVD comes or it's in theaters and go buy that ticket or buy that DVD. And then when it happens, they can either pay 10 bucks for the, th the, uh, the ticket of the theater or not pay. Or they can pay 20 bucks for the DVD or not pay. That's it. So there are three kinds of audience members, all right? There is uh, the first kind that is the person who might have heard about the film, might have been interested in the film, maybe you had something on the web, maybe there was an ad, and they're like, okay, uh, I think I'll see that film. But just on the merits of the film, what they heard, they'll go. Okay, that's kind number one. Kind number two is, I don't know about this film, but I like Karen. I like her style, I like her work, I will see this movie because I like that other thing she did. So they're fans of you, and they're not so sure about the movie, but they'll go because of you. That's kind two, right? Then there's kind number three, which is, I don't care what you do, I'm giving you money to do it, I'm going to help you do it, I'm going to come do it, I'm your mother, I'm your brother, I'm your husband, I'm your son, I'm, you know, whatever. Those are your fanatical, unconditional helpers, okay? So you got one, two, and three, right? In the old way, you didn't know which was which. You couldn't get in touch, you couldn't differentiate your fan base, you didn't know some people just came because they wanted to see the film, some people came because they saw your old film, and some people came because they would do anything you tell them, right? So, in the new way, um, oh, and finally, those three people all had one option. They could either buy it or not buy it. So if they kind of wanted to see it but weren't sure, and then they bought, they just paid ten bucks. 
If they really wanted to see it, they paid ten bucks. If they were crazy about you and totally would see anything you did, they paid ten bucks. Now they might pay ten bucks twice and buy someone else a ticket, or pay it ten times and give someone else, you know, a hundred people tickets, or whatever, you know, buy a bunch of DVDs for people, but they only could do that thing, right? The revolution of crowdfunding, and again, I think it should be called something else, is that now you can pull all of those people all the way into your process, starting the moment you think, I should make a movie, right? And so now you go out to your immediate community, and that of course includes the number threes, your mom, your sister, your brother, whatever. It might include your, the number twos, right, which are people who saw your other film, so you have a list. It probably could include number ones, because through doing your other things, you have some people who might be interested in the film you're just thinking of, right? But now what you're offering isn't, hey, I'm going to make this movie and someday pay me ten bucks to go see, see it in theater, or give me twenty bucks for a DVD. Now what you're suddenly doing is you're unsealing all of the value in the creation of the artist, artistic piece. There's value all the way from the moment you start thinking about it to the moment you have that DVD or the, or the ticket, right? And that value exists in people's interest in the subject, their interest in you, or their just fanatical support of any of those things, the subject or you or, you know, or, or your career. So now what you can do is when you have the idea, you say, hey, I'm thinking of making a romance in Italy, okay, and it's going to be about uh, two old people, okay, they're, you know, senior citizens, so I'm really excited, and so you start sharing that in your social network. Now, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to say anybody who wants to be involved in this way, or that way, or the other way, can, by sharing with me something you have, which is maybe money, or time, and in exchange, I'm going to give you the experience of creation of that thing that you love. Everybody who's a fan of romance movies, everybody who's a fan of Italy movies, everybody who's a fan of movies about senior citizens, and of course everyone who's a fan of me, right? So you can give perks based on the experience of creation. So you can say, hey, uh, we're going to have a, an opportunity, you can, you can get in, in communication with people about what should the film be about, I have this idea and that idea, you can start communicating with all these people, you can start offering, hey, if you want your name to be the name of the you know, hotel that the, the, the main characters have dinner at, we, it'll cost 150 bucks. You can come on the set, you can hang out, and people start to get excited and be involved. Then what you start to do is through the process of, you, also, there's also, back up, there's also ways that you can offer an experience of meeting you and meeting all of the other people involved. Maybe there's fans of the actors. Maybe there's people you're going to shoot on location in Italy. Maybe you can say, for this amount of money, join us on location in Florence, and da da da, da. And, you know, that costs you 2000 bucks, we charge 8000 bucks. Maybe people really love you, and it has nothing to do with the movie, but they love you, so you say, hey, I'm going to cook you dinner, and that's 600 bucks. whatever. Pick a number. The point is that what it taps into is human beings' desire to be involved in an artistic endeavor that takes years, but they don't have years. They might be an accountant, or a lawyer, or you know, they're a mom, and they just made that choice. But they want to touch the filmmaking process, and they want to touch the people they're fans of. And they can pay for it, and they will. Because before, all they could do was pay 10 bucks to go to a theater, right? Or 20 bucks to buy a DVD. But now, they can pay more, and they can have their, their name involved, they can be in, involved with someone they love, they can be involved with the whole process of movie making, or specific kinds of movie making. And so what that does, at the end of the day, after you've figured out all those things that you can offer, and as a perk, and get all these people involved, is you've moved people who are casually interested, the number ones, into number threes, right? Where they're crazy about you, because they're invested in the film, they have their name on the hotel, they were on set, they know all the actors, they know the guy who does craft services, this is their movie. And so what happens is by the time that you get to the end of production, which in the old days was where you would start even trying to find an audience, what do you have? You have all of these fans, first of all, who never would have even been involved with you, then you have, of those fans, a giant number of number ones, which would have been, maybe I'll see the movie, they're shifted over to, I'm a wild and rabid fan of you, like your mother. And what happens then? The day that you release, they're all ready. They're locked and loaded, not just to buy the ticket, which they would have done, but to evangelize about the film. This is their film. So suddenly, you don't just have your network, you don't just have your list from your old movie, you don't just have your actors' lists, you have all of the lists of all of the people that ever got involved in the whole two years of your pre-production, production, post-production, post -production, that have been paying for the opportunity to do it. So you have a new army of evangelists for your film, the day it comes out, into distribution, 
that have paid you for the opportunity to be there. That is the revolutionary benefit of crowdfunding. Gary, I'm curious why you turned to Kickstarter to self-publish your book. Why not go a more traditional route? It was a process, actually. It was, it, was, it was an educational learning curve for me. It took me a while to figure out that I didn't want a publisher, that I did want to self-publish, and the relevant reason primarily is I really wanted Manifest Destiny. I wanted to own my own intellectual property and not give it up and not be on a royalty basis with a publisher who wasn't going to market it anyway. I thought, you know what, I really want because I care deeply about what's in the book. It represents 25 years of my life. And I've always been in love with the storytellers, with the creatives, and I want to get this information out. So I thought if I own it, I'm more free to do that in more innovative ways. So number one, I thought I'm going to self-publish. The second step was then how do you self-publish? It's a very fast shifting landscape, this world of publishing. And it's, it's every day, it's, it's changing by the hour. And I, I thought about it, I thought, okay, I, I've decided some things that are good for me. And there's a lot of moving parts, so I thought, okay, I'm going to hire layout designers and people to e-format it and book cover design it, and I'm going to hire a printer and order a certain book run, and on and on. And there's a long laundry list, right? I thought, you know what? If I do all that, that's great. I'll have a beautiful book and no audience, and I have to start from zero. Then I just then I thought I started these conversations asking people about crowdsourcing, crowdfunding in particular, about Indiegogo, about Kickstarter, and I realized Kickstarter really was a phenomenal opportunity. Not just because, and, 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 and the least of it was the fundraising. Uh, what was most interesting to me was I get this period of time over which to build a community. I get to find my brand evangelist. I get to um, really put my message out, almost serialize it, right, over time, and drive traffic from all quarters, from traditional media and my database and other people to this place called Kickstarter. And it's very dynamic. So this to me was the perfect community building opportunity, pre-seed, pre, you know, just till the soil. Right. How much pre-planning did you do before you launched the campaign and what sources did you go to to gather information on crowdfunding? Um, well, I have a, uh, my, my partner, Morgan, is very astute about social strategy, so she knew a fair amount about it to begin with. Um, I did not. I had to sort of study from the beginning. And, but she brought me up to speed fairly quickly, and then we just asked a lot of people who we'd seen doing it that we, we had contacts to. Um, and you just Google, and you, you know, today, how do you learn? You Google, and you ask people, and you get on social media, and you ask people. Um, but it became very clear that Kickstarter was the platform that was the best fit for us. And, uh, and I'll be honest with you, you, you know, it's, it's not quite as neat and clean as you would hope. You use your best judgment, you go with your gut, because I think your gut is your best guide for this kind of a social experience. Um, it's not a sales job. You can't, you just, it's got to be about something bigger than that. So it felt like if we just stay, if we were really vulnerable and honest and candid and, and committed to what we're doing and put that message out, whether it's the video or the copy or however we present, our choice of our ways of saying thank you, the perks that we put together, the people that we enrolled from my film industry community to be a part of that, if we created that as the ethos, the fabric of who we are and what we're doing and we stayed true to that, how bad could we fail? So that's how we began, was just sort of seat of the pants. And we've learned so much every week, and it's only been two weeks into the campaign, we've learned so much. Well, it looks like what, you're almost 80% funded or something? Or you're very we're, we, we're, we're just 90% funded, and we're about halfway through. Uh, and now we just did a Twitter tweet-a-thon today, and we're getting some traditional media to drive traffic to it over the coming 10 days or week. Um, and I, I think we're learning how to um, uh, not sustain energy, but actually build it and create a bigger conversation and bring more, invite more people in. And what's interesting is how much people are ready to say yes. People really like to be part of this kind of open conversation about something they deeply care about. And not, they don't deeply care about it because it's necessarily screenwriting and they're not a screenwriter. It's about creativity. It's about 
seeing people realize, in this case maybe it's even seeing me realize a dream of mine. There's something that really tugs at people about that, and it's cool. Uh, you know what? It's, it's, it's one of those things you don't want to go back to the well very often. And I know because when I did it and when you guys did your Goodbye Promise, the first campaign, we, we were like way in the beginning of, of the whole phenomenon where people were really, really interested in giving us attention from a lot of film blog sites and people just donating because of the novelty of it. They wanted to see it succeed. But now, again, in 2013, there's one every day from somebody new and somebody you like, somebody you know. And it's just hard to, to keep up and try to you know, support everyone. Uh, I think I, if I were to do it, it wouldn't be for any significant amount. It, it's obviously nowadays it's a marketing tool. You see a lot of people doing it that get noticed and film festival programmers say they actually scour the crowdfunding websites as well. So if I were to do it, it'd be something for just, you know, a smaller nominal thing where I know I can make it, but it's mainly just to market the whatever project I'm, I'm working on. And that's probably the only time I would, unless, of course, you never say never. You know, the situation comes up like, it's the only way and I'm gonna give it a shot and you know, and you think it's been enough time between projects where you have enough, a new fan base where it's not the same old people, then you know, never say never. Mark, you were able to raise 75,000 on Kickstarter in three days mm -hmm. uh, for your Space Command project. What was your strategy when you launched this campaign? And then what did you find worked and what did you find did not work? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, I've sold over 100 scripts, all of the studios and the networks. And uh, in those cases, I didn't have to raise the money. For instance, when I was a producer on Sliders, we had a 22 episode order. Our budget was 1.3 million per episode. I didn't have to raise that money. <laughs> so although I knew I could write, and I know I can write and direct and produce, I'd never raised funds before. I didn't know if I would succeed. So the first thing I did was I treated it as, a, as something new I had to learn. And I spent several months talking to people, learning how to do it, building a team, uh, shooting the video, and really putting effort into the video because that would be, uh, you know, what, what I'd be using to show I could do the project. And uh, but I didn't know if it would work. I didn't know if I could raise money at all. And now we're up to 158,000. We still have um, several weeks, you know, a number of weeks to go. We're going to be having a panel at Comic Con. So there's 158 is not our final number by any means. And um, so. So what I basically did was, I realized I had to treat it with respect, and, uh, but I welcomed that. I welcomed learning a new thing, but I had no assumption that I would succeed. And going in with that attitude actually was very helpful because then it became uh, a continual learning process. And, uh, and, and the main thing I also knew was that you had to be in direct communication day by day with your backers, with your audience. You couldn't just, it's not pushing the big red button and then, you know, walking away. That, that's, I think, why a lot of people fail. Did you research other campaigns? What was your sort of due diligence? Yeah. Campaigns? Yeah. Well, fortunately, I run a round table of writers and directors and actors and producers, and we meet every Thursday, and we've been doing that for 19 years, and it's several thousand people. And so I put out the word on to my table saying, if anyone knows about Kickstarter, please send me information. So I got a lot of response, and so I started researching successful campaigns like Double Fine and some of the things Neil Gaiman was doing and, and then ultimately Neil um, uh, showed me the campaign that his wife Amanda Palmer was doing and so I was learning from that and, uh, and then just kind of course correcting as I went and some things you do uh, don't work and some things you do, do work and, uh, and then also you build a team and so when sh someone shows up who wants to help first of all you find out what their skills are and then you say okay well let's see if they're actually going to do it rather than just talk about doing it and, uh, and what's really also amazing is how fast everything is. There's instantaneous response. And so uh, it could be a 24-7 job if you let it, but you also have to not get exhausted because you have to keep a clear head to be able to do your job. How much time went into pre-planning? Uh, a couple months, two or three months, yeah. And, uh, and that was both shooting the video and also just you know, reading up on Kickstarter, talking to people, le learning. And, uh, um, but also, we actually launched about a month later than we intended, simply because we had to do make some further tweaks and we were refining the project. Because also, that's the other part of it, you're also working on the project as well, the, the, the series of films, and you're developing, the concept builds and grows, and people will give you input, and then you, so you, you're responsive to that. It really is a very direct uh, two-way conversation. 
Now the video is excellent. Thanks. And uh, I'm wondering how much time you put into planning that because you have so many elements in it. You have the personal element where we yes. meet you and other people in your ensemble, mm -hmm. but then you also have the fun stuff in the background yes. and, and all of the, the other work that you've done. Well, the, it was it was um, we put a couple months in on on the video and. Uh, Part of it, one thing I recognized with Kickstarter that was very, very clear, is that you have to have the personal touch. It's the person, the individual saying, hi, this is who I am, I really would like your help. It's usually one person, whether it's Double Fine or Amanda Palmer, it's usually the the um, the one-on-one. -on -one. And fortunately, I was a commentator on Morning Edition for three years, uh, long ago, <laughs> and I've done a lot of media interviews, and so I'm very comfortable um, with that. And I think that helped. But also, in my campaign, it was, me as a person, but it was also, this is the body of work I've done, and then the third part is, this is the team I'm, I've assembled, and it's an amazing team, and then it was the special effect shots that we were generating fresh, saying this is what, what we're doing is going to look like. So it wasn't just, you can look at our work from the past, but there's no telling what we're going to do now. Here's something very concrete that we generated new, specific, to this project, and that was very important because otherwise, people are going to be dubious. But if you say, okay, look, look at this. If you like this, if you like these effect shots, if you like these actors uh, who are going to be casting, then you get a pretty good idea about what we're up to. How did you choose your incentives? That took a long time. To, in terms of choosing the incentives, we looked at other campaigns, we thought about ourselves as, as geeks <laughs> and what we'd like. Because uh, when I was a kid, uh, Star Trek debuted, the original Star Trek, and I was a huge Star Trek fan. And, uh, and they, they were very slow in terms of merchandising products from Star Trek initially. There were very few. And I longed for different, you know, model kits and, and action figures and toy phasers and all that stuff. So I was just kind of thinking about me as a fan and, and what would appeal to me and what would I like to have and what would be interesting. And it was a mixture of several things because I was thinking about the different uh, kind of people who would be um, pledging to Space Command. And so there would be the fans, who were just science fiction fans, they, they'd love to be part of this and maybe get a Space Command watch or a Space Command jacket. Uh, then there were also the people who might be visual effects people and maybe they want to be part of the team or they want to learn from what we're doing. So there's also the, the how-to aspect. So I actually posted something called the One Minute Film School that's about how you pitch a script, how you you know write write a movie, how you direct a movie with my friends and like Guillermo del Toro and. Uh, my friend Michael Nathan directs Battlestar Galactica in, in these videos talking about those things. Uh, and then there's another uh, uh, part of it that might be aspiring actors who might want to be part of the project. So they might want to walk on a walk-on role or a speaking role. Um, or there might be someone who wants to have a producer credit and so they can put money in and get a producer credit. So, so I was thinking about the different reasons that someone might be interested and how they might want to participate. And those are different uh, sort of pie wedges of the whole of the whole pie. And so you have to be mind, mindful of that as well. There's not one size fits all. What are the first few things that someone needs to do before they crowdfund? Good question. Uh, I guess um, investigation of the market first. It's like look around what's going on, what projects are being successful, what's happening, why they are successful, what other people is doing. Uh, look around and see if there is any project that is similar to yours and, and what's the best way to... You know, when we started with the Coachman, as I said, we took all these projects that inspired us and we took what was best out of each one and put it together and tried to build our own model instead of just fitting in what was and what existed at the time. Uh, so I think that's important to, you know, uh, research a little bit. And then I think it's important to be prepared to be very, very honest. I think that's one of the things that work better in our projects. Like, don't oversell. Sell what you have and, and try to make what you have really good. But you, you know you need to be sure that what you're doing is really good, and 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 be honest what, with what you're doing. Be transparent. I mean, don't hide anything. Just tell the you know when when, when our investor, our co-producer, Russian co-producer, drop out, we could have just said nothing because we were at risk that five thousand people that had given us money would you know freak out to know that suddenly we had. 130,000 euros less and that the film was at risk but instead of just you know 
saying nothing, we, we were very public and we said, guys, we are on the same team, help us out. And it worked. And every time something like that happened to us, like, you know, some things that went wrong or, or some things that we knew that people weren't, maybe some people weren't going to like, we were like, you know, this is how it is, this is how we think, and, and it's the way it goes. And I think that's one of the most important things, to be prepared to be honest. I don't know if there's any, anything else that I can advise to be prepared to. How much should someone have invested in social media beforehand? That goes back to our question, sort of, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, and how do you stay honest in doing that? It seems like it's almost hard in some ways to to build a, a campaign if you know that you're going to, or excuse me, it seems like it's almost difficult to, to build a social media network a little bit before a campaign, if you know that. It's, it's difficult and I, I don't think it's something you can pay for. I mean, you can pay for a campaign or for a social media, whatever, analyst or, or company, and they can they can help you. But, you know, at some point, for example, every, again, every time a client comes to us and says, you know what, we're going to do this social media campaign and I want uh, a CEO and I want, you know, all these tricks they use to uh, get traffic to the site, we say, you know what, we are not, I mean, we are not for you. Go to somebody else because that's not natural. I mean, it's not, you, you of course, you can build numbers, but they're just numbers. That's what we've been, you know, fighting with brands for the last three years because all they say is you only have uh, 5,000 users, 5,000 fans. I say, okay, just take any page that has 50,000 fans that were probably, you know, it's just it's kind of easy to get numbers. So take that, put a post, and let's see how many comments does it have. And it usually has, you know, 15 people commenting, 50 likes, and we have 5,000, and, you know, when we say something cool, we have 200 comments and 500 likes. So it's like, that's our numbers. So, uh, again... It's not about the amount, it's about the quality. So you need to start from the ground and start, you know, be like very little at the beginning and, and trying to connect with people and trying to grow grow bigger, but you need time for that. That's, you know, the worst thing of this is like, it took us three years to build a community and it's not even really big. Uh, so you need to be prepared to have time to build that. You can't do that in 30 days unless you're lucky you know, this happened to us. It's like we launched the project and then uh, the week after, one of the biggest blogs in Spain talked about us because they liked the project and that was huge. Suddenly a thousand people were coming to our site and, and, and all of them were talking about us because they loved the project and, you know, that it, it spreads. But you need to find something or be lucky enough to have like a kickstart, something that, you know, makes it big. And from there, well, you, it depends on how good you are and on making it bigger. Uh, but it's difficult. It's difficult to find something like that. I mean, as I said, you can't do something viral. It happens. You can't prepare for it. You can do it, you know, have something that might be. But again, try 100 different things and some of them might go viral and, and, and give you the first kickstart. Well, you mentioned it is work. I mean, it's like having a full-time job yeah. and then some. What's your day like knowing that you launched the campaign? Was it two days ago? Or? Yeah, I think two or three days ago. Okay. Yeah. So do you have like a set, uh, like a checklist of what you're doing every day to, to keep that, that drum going? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so much work going on between uh, the Kickstarter campaign and then the other fundraising that we're doing for this project just with investors and whatnot. That I don't have, even have time to create a proper checklist. You know, every day we every every day we come in, it's just kind of a mad scramble to kind of do what needs to get done. We know we need to update people. We know we know we need to kind of check to see where we're at with Kickstarter. Um, I'm a little obsessive about it, and I check maybe every hour or so, maybe sometimes more. Um, and so, you know, the, the obvious things are, you know, making sure we're tweeting it out at least once or twice a day, and not doing it in an annoying, in-your-face kind of way. Um, same with the Facebook updates and, you know, Facebook and tw Twitter alone, there's multiple accounts that we're managing between, like, the company's Twitter account and the film's account. So, 
yeah, there's a lot of kind of just social media building graphics that we'll know that we know we'll need either that day or down the road. Um, so yeah, just kind of a roundabout answer, um, saying that we don't know what we're doing half the time and just kind of doing as much as we possibly can to get the word out every day. Yeah. What determined um, the length of time you were going to choose for the campaign? I believe it's what thirty-one days. So I, th I think it's thirty-one days. 31 yeah. Thirty-one days. Uh huh. Um, and also the amount, thirty-three thousand. Thirty-three thousand. Yeah. The the we came up with thirty-three thousand as the goal, in part because we had to be realistic with what we could raise, um, given our network, given our our history with crowdfunding. Like I just wanted to make sure we're being realistic uh, and not overshooting it, because as we all know, Kickstarter is all or nothing, and we don't want to lose, you know, lose out. Um, so that was one consideration. The other consideration was, what will be enough to get the ball rolling on the film? What's enough to to develop the project fully, and what's enough to kind of just start um, the the production process? And thirty three thousand was kind of the magic number. Oh, and the other element, of course, is is um, in, in factoring in the cost to produce the perks and the rewards and whatnot for for backers. And so yeah, thirty three thousand thirty three thousand was the the magic number um, to get the ball rolling on the project and and what we realistically thought we could raise. And so you decided to not go with like a fifty two day campaign. You wanted it shorter. I'm just. I'm yeah, I'm, I can't, I'm trying to remember why we decided 31 days. I mean, we wanted to we wanted to end the campaign on a Friday, like in the evening, because everyone says to end it on a Friday, which is often payday for people, and you know you want to give enough time to people to get home from their jobs, get on their email, and exactly <laughs> do glass this of wine. Oh yeah, glass here. of wine and get loose, and you know, um, honey, get the wallet. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I think I think it ends on Friday, like at ten thirty p.m. or something like that. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, and did you? I mean, research other campaigns to see what you saw worked. And did yeah, we researched a lot of campaigns. Mm -hmm. We probably looked at uh, about a hundred different campaigns. We watched all the videos. We looked at their rewards, their perk structure. Um, all the text on the actual Kickstarter page and you know a lot of it came down to kind of what felt good to us and we kind of went with our gut as far as 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 a viewer as an audience member as a fan what do we want to read on these pages and what kinds of perks would get us excited um, so along the way we were just constantly telling ourselves let's put ourselves in their shoes what do they want to see what do they need to know what will excite them um, and so that that helped a lot yeah and what are the perks? Um, the perks for our Kickstarter campaign include some of the more common things like, you know, exclusive updates about the film at the $2 level. And then, of course, a copy of the DVD, a download of the film. But then we came up with some unique things like um, Instagram uh, Polaroid coasters. Uh, because this film is going to be so visually driven, and hopefully cinematically kind of beautiful, we, we wanted to kind of do something having to do with photography. So yeah, one of the perks is these cool little, uh, insta um, these like Polaroid cup coasters. Um, you know, postcards and posters, uh, a dinner with myself and the uh, author of a book called In Pursuit of Silence, which I'm sort of, um, so what has sort of influenced this, this film. Um, and so things like that, yeah, yeah. Oh, that sounds really cool. Yeah, like that. yeah. That's, that's Creative, the the dinner and with the author, I like that. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. And an, another consideration was um, because I experienced this with our last crowdfunding campaign. Like, it's got to be rewards that are relatively simple for us to put together. Um, one thing that was a constant thorn in our side with the last crowdfunding campaign was this photo book, this elusive photo book that we promised backers, and it seemed like a really cool idea because we had a photographer on set. Uh, on every shoot that we took in Haiti, and so we had these gorgeous photographs, and we thought, cool, let's, you know, let's do a photo book. How hard could it possibly be? You know, and it was just like it was just so it was expensive. It took just so much time to design it, um, and it was just way more work and money than than we anticipated, and it became a pretty big problem for us here in the office, just trying to get that done on time, and um, it ended up being you know several months late, but people were happy when it finally came. And that was that Jess. Jess Kaler, yeah, Jess Kaler was our photographer, and she's yeah. brilliant. I mean, we, we, want, we wanted to showcase those photos so badly, and that's kind of what drove us to want to do this photo book, but we didn't realize how much work it would be. Well, yeah, yeah, beautiful photos I remember seeing. Yeah, I'll have to get you guys a copy of the book oh. before you guys leave, yeah. Sherry, what, what's the question you get asked most often? 
Um, I think everybody is really curious about audience, audience building and crowdfunding. I get a lot of questions about, you know, usually after a campaign's already launched, which sometimes is too late to be asking that question. Often as well, when you're launching, um, uh, you're going about to launch your film and then you start asking questions about the audience, that's totally backwards. Um, that all of these questions really need to be started in the very beginning of this, you know, when you're making the film, when you're writing the script, when you're thinking about it, there should be in your mind, who, who am I writing for? Who do I imagine watching this movie that I'm writing? I would think that would make it easier a little bit in the process that you're, you know, maybe putting in in jokes or you're uh, being sure to include a certain kind of information because you know that's wh what your audience is going to want to know. If you don't have that idea when you're writing, it continues to be a problem throughout into distribution because it's it remains vague. You're not sure who you're going after. You're not sure who's going to respond to this material. And it makes it that much harder because you're putting all your time and your effort and your money into this without a clear idea of how you're going to get anything out of it. Um, so, you know, that's one of the big questions is audience. And the time to ask that is not we're in post and now we're trying to figure it out or we're about to raise money in crowdfunding and we need to figure this out. It's when you're developing the idea. And to start with, I ask, well, who are you? You know, what, what are you interested in? What drew you to this story? Why do you feel compelled to tell it? Then where do you hang out online? Where do you hang out offline? What do you read? Who do you listen to? All those aspects to starting with with you makes it lots easier because you know yourself. You know that's not hard to to identify. Um, it's when they start with these demographics, 18 to 35 women. You know uh, that's a huge huge disparate group. They don't all love the same things. So thinking more along the lines of interest and psychology and what emotionally moves it really takes you then out of an age group. You're really targeting then an interest group, a psychology that you want to find. And it's much easier to find those people than when you're just targeting a blank age. And, and once you do, once you have identified your audience and you're sort of ready to take that next step, um, what are those next steps? You know, where do you go from there? Well, um, I have sort of changed my thoughts about when you should start this process of audience engagement. One, I think that artists should be doing that all the time. So in that way, you are creating your own identity. In marketing speak, it would be brand. I find filmmakers don't like to use that word, but I mean, in marketing, that is what it is. A brand is your identity, your personality. So you should be sharing that personality all the time when you're online. Professionally, I don't mean what are you having for breakfast, where you went on vacation with your family, you know, deep dark secrets about yourself. I don't mean to 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 make all your private thoughts known and your privacy um, given up. But from a professional standpoint, what drives you? What motivates you? Um, and and start. You can start today. You know, with sharing that of figuring of of pulling people toward you who are of that same mindset, who are compelled by the same thing you're compelled with. Um, and a great book that I read over Christmas was called Start With Why. It's by Simon Sinek. Um, and he uh, says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So you should always be showing people your why. You know, you should always start from thinking, how does this show why I do what I do? And those same people who are compelled to do, to think that way or do those things or are motivated by the same things that you are, get drawn to you. Now, if you're a negative person, and I've seen this happen a lot online where people are very cutting and they cut other people down and they always have really negative things to say and then they get surprised when negativity <laughs> starts coming back at them, you know, on their sites, in their comments, on their blogs, on their Facebook page, lots of negative comments. It's what, what you're putting out in the world is what is coming back into you, what's attracted to you. So if you don't want that, then don't be that, don't show that. Um, of yourself online um, but so that's what you start to begin with now if you have a project during the time when you're in production when you're writing and you're in production you're you're stockpiling you're collecting you're looking for all the assets that you're going to be able to use or that you can use to create more material for later but 
hold off on the online engagement, opening up your social channels, till you're about six months from your premiere. Because in six months, you can keep the motivation up, you can keep the momentum, you can release new things, and six months is not a terrible burden. And the audience can stay with you for that long. If you're two years or three years to making a film, you're not gonna be able to keep up that project specific um, content release for very long. It's just, it will be too draining for you, you'll run out of ideas, and the audience will get bored. You know, they, they, when is this thing happening? When is this thing coming out? They kind of do expect that when they hear about it, it's soon going to be released and they'll be able to see it. So they can wait about six months or about four months, but they can't wait for indefinite period of time. So when you're thinking about project-wise, for a long time you're going to be collecting and thinking about how you're going to release. And then when you get into post and when you see, okay, we're about six months from when, it doesn't have to be a firm date. You know, you don't have to know. If you're doing it from a festival, you won't know if you're going to get in. But you know around October or around January, it'll be ready and we will be looking to have the premiere. Then get started. Then start um, showing your, your project off and getting interest and getting people. Then you're maintaining your pages and you're cultivating an audience for the project. How many days into the campaign are we? Uh, what, 54 right now? Yeah, 50, so we're like five days in yeah, or something yeah, like yeah. that. Okay. Five days five in days. and we've got 54 days left. Yeah. Uh, it's nerve-wracking. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's very nerve-wracking. But we're going to work as hard as we can to, you know, yeah. uh, reach the public with this project as best as we can. Uh, we're going to tweet it and, and until my fingers fall off. I'm going to yeah. email Facebook, it and send it out. Email. Yeah. I haven't slept in... <laughs> we haven't slept, we've just been online there all night just sending it to people, trying to reach reach, reach a lot of people out there so they can try to help us support this project. So. Yeah, we're getting very good responses. Yeah. A lot of people really like the project and uh, uh, they really uh, like the videos and uh, they, they're they inspired by it too. The thing is though, I, I, I'm learning though, people are, they gravitate to the child abduction, human trafficking in this country too. So they're like, I didn't know that and I have a supplementary video that gives a lot of statistics about those subjects and uh, when people see that I get I'm getting a lot of emails and uh, uh, tweets back about I didn't know that it was really happening here and then that just gives me more and more fuel and lets me know that this pro you know film needs to be made so that people can be more aware of it is anybody resonating with the characters trying to change the course that they were once on and make a new life or is that not totally revealed not totally it's revealed. Not really. um, that's the to me. I think that's uh, more the intricacies of the story. And for me, uh, to sum it up, the the real cause for me though, it's a great story. But the real cause for me is the child abduction, human trafficking. You know, in the country, I, I hope people are really aware of that and and and, and uh, you know become aware that that is something that's happening here. And uh, you know, and you know, I hope that inspires people to really uh, you know, get behind the cause. But uh, the Kickstarter has been going really good. Um, We've got a long way to go, but you know we're still going to keep pushing it and getting it out there, and we, we hope people uh, you know help us get this film made. And so, what are the the ground rules you have? Like, do you have a daily checklist of what you do, or just you just know every day is go, hit the ground running? It's, and it's just me and him. So some people, some, 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 some people some people yeah. have like a team of like 20 people before they kick start. It's just me and him. So yeah. I got the the, the morning routine uh, go online, and uh, he also he also he also does the same thing. So yeah. we do it in the morning and at night. So we barely yeah. sleep. We we on it all the time. Yeah, we, we take like talk. breaks here and there because sometimes you get discouraged. Wow, I just sent in like a thousand emails. I don't. It's still not moving. You know what I mean? And then uh, oh yeah, somebody plays. I'm like, okay, we're good. Let's keep yeah. going. Let's keep yeah. going. So, it doesn't take much yeah. to keep us going. Yeah. You know, yeah. all I need is a good tweet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You retweet yeah. me, I'm still yeah, going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to quit if you retweet me. Yeah, uh, so, uh, I'll take the little things for now. Yeah. But yeah, we work in shifts yeah. and, you know, it's, we take our breaks, yeah. you know, because you, know, you put in hours doing that, you get kind of loopy uh, yeah. looking at the screen yeah, so much. So, you know, take a break and, you know, get a cup of coffee, go at it again, you know. Uh, in the end, it's, you know, it's just trying to reach as many people, you know, as we can. I think we have, too, because we get a lot of people, like maybe like... Uh, that, that like like the page or they just uh, send us a message. Oh, we like we like the project, but they don't they don't pledge. But we get a lot of them that that like the project and stuff like that. So we we reaching some of them. We doing we doing good so far. The time frame that we are on five days, so we are doing good so far. So what are some of the highs and some of the lows 
what 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 mm. things are, are the ones where you go mm, and then takes you back up again besides the tweets. What, what okay, uh, it's just filmmaking in general or the Kickstarter oh, for promotion the Kickstarter. for the Kickstarter. We keep ourselves going. We keep ourselves going. <laughs> so yeah, it's literally like, it, and yeah. luckily, it's it, we're, we're never at a point yeah. where we're both down. Yeah. So it's he'll, always he'll, just he'll, like he'll call me five, four yeah. in the morning. Yo, oh, you good? Oh, and I'll call him again. Oh, you good? We call him. We, we call each other like, every, yeah. every like two, three hours. We call each other. I, I was. Yeah. I, I would definitely say the low for me is if you get back somebody like, uh, uh, you know, you, you you get some negatives every once in a while. Yeah. Like, oh, uh, you know, I don't know you, so don't send me tweets and stuff like that. You get you get stuff like that, yeah, but yeah. then uh, you know, you hit a couple people later and somebody. They retweets me and I'm say, hey, thank you, Anna. and that's enough for me to keep going because not everybody shares the same mentality, and you know, it, I just feed off of that. You know, you're gonna have negativity and things like that, but you you have to again. Here comes the thick skin. You just yeah. let it roll off and you yeah. keep on going. You know. So you're your own support system. Yeah. To you. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. And it works because we're both stubborn. So it's like, exactly. <laughs> we're, we're both extremely stubborn. We won't, we so won't quit. We won't quit. We, we, we're gonna find some way to get through it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like my mom said, if somebody blocks you, try to break the door, go through it. So that's how we. That's how we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I find it very interesting that, that you two said that um, you knew this twenty-eight thousand dollar goal was kind of like wow, this was at the high end of the spectrum, you know. And, and, and you said that you two kind of like going after the impossible and, and sort of like really pushing it. Um, can, can we talk about setting setting that particular number goal? Because I, I think that's that's often one of the things that everyone sort of struggles with. It's like, okay, I think I want to make this project, and I think I'm going to want to try to try crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. And setting that goal can be so tricky because you just don't know. You don't, yeah. you don't know how to size it up. So can, yeah. can you talk about the $28,000 goal? And yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think our, our original plan um, was to do a second season of our web series. And when we ran the numbers for that, we were going to originally run a crowdfunding campaign for that. But we were going to set that uh, at maybe 10 to 12. And you know, when looking at the numbers of what, what we expected and hoped to get where we could reach, um, we, thought, we thought that was doable. Um, then we decided to to change it up, do it as a feature, um, and, and so nothing as far as our resources change, but but the budget change, yeah. and so we we set it at a at the minimum point that we could do production of, of the feature. So that's how that's how we came to uh, that number. So that doesn't necessarily even cover all of production, but it covers enough. Um, that we could still find a way to get production, um, production wrap, uh, get it in the can. So that's how I came up with that number. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, like he said, you know, our original thought was okay, maybe ten thousand for, for the, the second season of the web series. And you know, when we did the first one, we didn't have any budget at all. I mean, we had a camera and a lot of interested people and a lot of drive and, and, you know, that's about it. And. You know, when we looked at our final product, we were we were proud of the experience and that we had done it and we had spent so many countless hours doing it. But you know, getting to do it a second time, I mean, that's a really unique opportunity to be able to work with the same people and kind of see them grow, ha having seen them grow over the year and like what else they're bringing to the table. And even myself, like I'm, I'm kind of new at this, you know, because he he's always been doing this, but it's not until recently that you know, his goals became my goals as well. And so, you know, I I, I and um, I had a lot more to bring with myself as well. So, you know, we talked about a lower number, but it's like, that's not, we, we didn't want to make the same mistake as the first time, you know, where we're just having a very ambitious project where you can't get it reasonably shot and it's not what it looks like, or it's not what you want it to look like in the end. So I think, you know, we had to, like that was actually the minimum number that we would need and, you know, we could supplement the rest with, you know, our own income or, yeah. You know, take I a loan here and there or whatever, but you know, we, we can make up that small difference that we needed to get to our to our full budget. But um but any lower than that, you know, if we had set it at twenty five or if we had set it at ten, I mean we're still looking at you know, trying to raise another ten, fifteen and mm. and you know, who yeah. knows where that would have put us in the end. And and our goal with this film was to to make a good film. Um, like she said with the first season of the web series, you know, we had no budget, we uh, we had no uh, not a lot of production value, um, and we didn't want to make another. We didn't want to make another project that was good, given the resources. We just wanted to make one that was good. Period. Um, not like well, that was good considering what you didn't have, or that was good considering mm -hmm. this or that or that. Just you know, something that was good.
So you're preparing to launch a crowdfunding campaign? Yes, in February, March, to um, to give us a nice little production budget for uh, season two yeah. of Labs. So what's some of your prep work that you're doing? Uh, it's going to be, well, the biggest thing is like trying to figure out what are these rewards. You know, that's mm -hmm. such a big thing because that's that's um, the thing that's enticing people to donate. You know, what, what are they getting out of it? And um, I'm actually... Uh, I'm I'm gearing I'm I'm compiling a list, but I don't have like a set list yet of things. Some of them are like um, uh, we did a commentary for season one that I never released. So and it's with it's honestly so long ago that I don't remember doing this. Remember me art or me you yes. me and Art Hall, who is not here right now, yeah, sitting next to me. I a manifestation day. of that. I'm, I'm, I'm actually Rache in a mask. Wow. Yeah. I would have gotten away with it too. Yeah. All right. So yeah, we all sat around. We, we all like... sat around. We uh, Matt Lewis was there. Where, where do we record this? At Rache's apartment. <gasps> You're right. We all oh, okay. Okay. Was there some wine involved? It, what, uh, probably. Uh, was... Chances, I guarantee. Actually, there were. Usually, some whenever pharmaceuticals I, also. Whenever I do commentary, that's usually how. Usually wine. So you always okay. hear a crack of a beer can or a, of a it's bottle. It's Miller time. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's Miller time. <laughs> She knows me. Yeah. So we uh, right. so that is we did that, yeah. and I'd like to put that out as like a, one of the rewards because it's really funny. <laughs> it's probably I'm gonna guess. Maybe it's just funny to us, but no, I'm just kidding. No t-shirts. You're not doing t-shirts. I would like to do t-shirts. Oh, you're just doing t-shirts. Okay. Yeah, because the yeah, show that's a good idea. the show is such a workout. You know, like right. going to the track kind of thing. It'd be cool to have like a tank top or something. You know. Not you know, fanny pack. Fanny pack. Right to keep the phone and the cigarettes. In yeah, <laughs> exactly. All the things you need when you work out. You need the wide one for the cigars. You know? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Like a little hip humidor. Yeah. Um, that's a good idea, though. It's like flask. A, yeah. Well, maybe a flask. Maybe we could have DVDs of the first season. Yeah. You know. The bonus feature. Yeah. yeah. So. The audition tapes, I think, is. Mm. Uh, yeah. Oh, interesting. He doesn't like. No one likes audition tapes. Okay. All right. I don't. I mean, no actors like. Well, maybe some actors like their own audition tapes, and if they do, I'm a little leery about them. <laughs> <laughs> a little leery about that. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm getting that stuff together, and then uh, in a couple weeks we're we're gonna shoot the prom like the the pitch video. Oh great. Yeah. Okay. And are you having everybody involved, and yeah, you'll narrate it, or uh, I'll probably. Sort of like the video journal, I'll intro it, yeah. but um, we'll shoot it back at the track, and I'd like to have all the roles cast by then, so that we can have the entire cast there and just be like, yeah, this is what we're, this is our team of actors and talent that uh, are going to bring season two to life, kind of thing, and then uh, ask for money. <laughs> are you doing research on what campaign videos sort of yes. strike a chord in you? Like, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. did you have any examples of? I know I am I was a great campaign video. I am I. Jocelyn Town, yeah, she did a great. Yeah, and there was also. Um, Why well, I, I do like, um, um, God, what's that guy that we were just talking about? The feature film that he's been working on for. Oh, years. oh, the guy from No No Film. Oh, Koo. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. Koo did such an amazing job with this video. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, the tricks that he used in that video was really cool. I don't know what I'm gonna pull off that, but you okay. know, yes. he had a really Mantle. good pitch, mm -hmm. and that's what this is gonna come down to: is do you have a compelling pitch? Right. And uh, yeah, I'm looking at other campaigns, and it's not like I'm using just one for like an example. I'm looking at several and then like taking piece by piece mm -hmm. and making notes kind of thing. So I wish I had more examples, but it's more just as I go, I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool, that's pretty cool. And I tuck it away. And then how have you determined how much you're going to ask for? One thing we've seen recently is that people are really going for these high amounts. Right. And it, it's, been, it's been harder these days to get them. I think people are, the honeymoon period's kind of over for crowdfunding, and I think it's, it's a little tougher now. Right. And uh, there's also a huge debate between Indiegogo and Kickstarter, mm -hmm. which I'm still debating. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it low. You know, um, I know that I can fall back on some, you know, uh, of my own personal money, but also uh, some friends here in LA that have camera equipment that uh, I would like to, you know, they've already said, yeah, you can go and use it. 
So I'm keeping the budget low. It's mostly for locations because it's such a, a bigger story, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The locations are, uh, that's going to be a big piece of it. And I want to be able to have the money for food and whatever. You know, lighting is a big thing too, so. Arts place. That's true. Uh, we, well, if there's a way to fake it into a two-bedroom uh, apartment, absolutely. I'm, I'm open to it. I've, I have, I've did various apartments. Sure. Various apartments I've lived in, I've always allowed people to film it, and like I, I'm like, oh sure, of course. Halfway through, I'm like, damn it, why did I say yes to this? Because it, you know, it's a little whirling dervish comes into your apartment, everything just gets all over. But of course, now we'll make it work, you know. But yeah. the world is much bigger, but I think it's going to strongly benefit us. So. Yeah. So I'm not going to shoot for the. I'm not going for a hundred thousand dollar budget. I'm going for like a thirty-five hundred. And oh. give yeah, it like pretty modest. Wow, I mean, it's, it's really yeah. modest mm -hmm. for what. Oh, we, I made season one on. Like twenty bucks, maybe plus craft services. Yeah, yeah, like however much bottles no, of water and services. donuts. <laughs> yeah, he Just didn't talk about tacos for everybody. Talk about tacos and lots of starches and carbs, <laughs> which is perfect for somebody that's trying to lose weight. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're not planning on going on any vacations or anything during the campaign. We talked about that earlier. No, okay. not at all. <laughs> no weddings or anything. No, he's not. Like, no, I'm just gonna. I mean, I'm going to Vegas for a couple of days in April, but that's pretty much it. Okay. So, yeah. You can't go to Vegas. Okay. I guess I'm not going to Vegas <laughs> okay. anymore. Well, you can tweet from, I from will tweet the casino. Shit. Tweet from, from Vegas. Vegas. I will send a picture of me at Caesar's. Yeah. Here Circus Circus, I think, has good Wi-Fi. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have the LTE network. That's true. I do. Okay. So, all right. Cool. We have plans. <laughs> So what else have you noticed from crowdfunding campaigns that you like? What, what are some of the things that you've seen that have really worked and then some that haven't? The over budgets, I feel like a big one. Mm -hmm. um, but not having a good pitch video to me, I feel like is, is the ones I've seen, I'm like, I would never donate to that because the video wasn't good. Whether it was the production value or just the pitch wasn't good. I just mm -hmm. didn't feel like it was a compelling enough story or you know that kind of stuff. So I really want to make sure I'm good with that. Do you think people view that as, okay, if the pitch video is bad, then what's the actual production going to look like? Exactly. Is this a representation of their work? Hmm. Well, I'm, I mean, that's the way I take it. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that just the pitch video is enough. I feel that people are buying not just a reward like a DVD or a t-shirt or a chance for a signed script or something. They're, they're trying to become a part of a process that they normally wouldn't be. So invite them along on that journey. Like, you know, yeah. show them where you're coming from, where you want to go, like the good things, the bad things that happen. So yeah. keep them in the loop. And that's what I've seen on the successful ones. I've only followed one or two. I mean, I'm very loose. I've hardly ever looked. But I, I know one of them was um, kind of an easy sell. I forgot the guy's name, but he was one of these video game developers in the 90s who did a lot of point and click adventures like Day of the Tentacle and stuff like that. And he wanted to make a throwback point and click game for all the people who reminisce like me and all those other people and he said a ah, hundred thousand dollars is what I need to fully design and engineer and develop this, this program and he would make videos if not weekly then daily to talk about progress mm. and all the artwork and everything he made three or four hundred thousand dollars because people were so on board with you know that and part of it is again the subject matter of you know you're you're playing on the nostalgia of the game you know culture from that era but he took you on a ride and showed you how did things work. And that, I think, is really the big thing. That's why it's, you need a marketing team or someone full time because it takes a lot to consistently update and send messages and video and then edit and all that stuff. So yeah. That's what I think is really the big indicator or big thing to help. And for me, the video is journals is, is, is trying to do that. Mm -hmm. And do you think you'll do a shorter campaign, 30 days or longer? Um, I'm, I'm right now I'm on 30. Yeah. What, what makes you like that date, that 30 day time? Uh, I don't know, it's a good number. 30, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's just a month and you try it out. If it, I, I, the other thing too is I know that there's the, the chance of failure. You don't make it in 30 days, you know? So then we need to, to do another campaign or... It's true, you have a fallback yeah. instead of putting it all in one 60 day campaign, I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm... Uh, <clears throat> I'm not doing this campaign to be like uh, I'm. I'm gonna, you know, please donate, and we might shoot in a year. It's like I'm doing this campaign. Please donate. We're shooting in May. You know, uh, we're ready to go. Well, you're not gonna be able to sleep if it's not exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, don't. You, I mean, yeah, you, I, you like to do things. Yeah, right away, and that's great. 
I, I like to have things ready. Like um, I didn't start. Uh, I didn't start trying to. I, I didn't try to cast lap season one without the script being in a good place. You know, I feel like there. You need to have confidence in, in uh, you know, if someone's going to come onto your team, you got to have a basis. You know, you got to have that, that thing is, that's going to motivate people to be like, no, I want to work on that. And, if, and that requires me to have my stuff in line, have it in check and ready, you know. Michael, how would you compare and contrast Kickstarter to Indiegogo? And would you give the edge to Indiegogo? Uh, they're very different now, Kickstarter and Indiegogo. I mean, when they first started, it was kind of like, hey, here's this new f platform for funding movies and whatnot. I think through time, they've kind of separated a lot. Uh, Kickstarter, obviously, is probably a little more mainstream. I, just from people I know, uh, talking to them, they, they, they feel a little more comfortable. Not so much anymore with Kickstarter, just because it's known a little more on the press and all that. I honestly, I, I don't know their goals or where they're going, but I feel like they're really separating. And kicks and Indiegogo is kind of the the place where you go, where you're, you're you know, the indie spirit, I should say, is alive in Indiegogo. Absolutely. Um, and it's and, and socially too, they do a lot of social campaigns that that work well. Kickstarter seems much more now, like I say, it's pre-sales now. They don't really, I don't know, they don't do so much pre-sales in movies anymore, but it's kind of. It's kind of going, I know the Kickstarter people probably don't like that because they sent messages and all that. Like, hey, you know, we're a donation-based site, but I think the because of Kickstarter's mainstream success, they've attracted, you know, certain companies, they've attracted like the video games, uh, industrial design type companies, which aren't, they're so already fully funded, they're not like a little movie where it's like, hey, we're gonna go shoot this little movie and hopefully it'll turn out good and it's just us and we're kind of artists. Um, not that video game people aren't artists by any means, but you know, it's, it's, it's in their business plan almost in a way as where Indiegogo still is uh, kind of independent and, and you know, we need your money to make this movie. Whereas the other things are kind of, we oh yeah, we, we just want to, cut off some of our losses before we release i.e. a video game or whatnot. So, but they both have uh, good and valid points. I would probably, our docs are a little more mainstream, so I think Kickstarter is a, a little better way to go um, for that, but then the movies we do are so, for such a limited audience that it's like, yeah, you know, and it's, it's the movies uh, such as the one we're doing now, it's, it's all people just doing the movie because they want to do the movie. You know, there's no other real goal. They're like, you know, all the actors kind of really like the concept and they want to do the movie because of the concept over uh, any kind of success they see in the future. Well, who's the audience for Love, Touch, Hate? What do you envision? It's such a it? tough answer to say who the audience for the movie is because it's a very, I think, on the, on the the actual movie is very, I think, audience friendly. It's a, it's a bittersweet comedy. There's elements of comedy. It's a father-son story, which we don't really talk about in the campaign because it's just too much to put in a little video. Um, the initial conceits of the movie could be mainstream, but it could be very, very indie. And my take on it is a very, very indie take because I'm just, I'm exploring something, and it's not the not the uh, the way the Hollywood movie would probably be in terms of structure. Um, so it's a kind of a tough thing to say. I think, you know, the audience is pretty, pretty small, but the people who actually show up to watch the movie would probably like it a lot, if that makes sense. Well, I think, number one, the most important thing is to start from a place of passion. I think uh, I could probably, n I would not have had a successful Kickstarter campaign, we wouldn't have had a successful Kickstarter campaign if we weren't truly 100% passionate about the film. Because your passion, I think, will come through in any type of promotion you do. 
video to me seems like the biggest no-brainer of all time for filmmakers but a lot of, you know a lot of filmmakers for whatever reason either they're gun shy about getting on camera or they don't want to come off as you know arrogant or pompous or you know what all the all the typical you know ways that people like to think of you know crazy filmmakers the truth is if you care enough about your project to you know sweat blood and tears to get it done you should care enough to tell people why and I think that if you start from a place of honesty and passion in however you're communicating, you'll already be ahead of the pack. Um, I think the mistake that a lot, I see a lot of indie filmmakers make when they start making some sort of tape is that they, they'll try to maybe like ape or copy uh, a different campaign that was successful. But that may be completely inappropriate for what it is they're doing, and more often than not, you watch a filmmaker and you go, "Who cares?" You know, I, you know, I, I don't care. And I bet you a lot of the filmmakers, when they watch that own tape, they probably don't. It probably doesn't move them. But I think if you, again, if you start from a place of honesty and and you you create something that's as real as the movie you made in the first place, something as personal and cool and quirky and interesting as your own work, people are going to respond. And I mean, listen, I'm a big sap, but I when I watch our Kickstarter video, I still tear up. And, you know, yes, part of it is because I have to admit that I look that goofy on camera, but part of it is because I, I really I really do it. The journey meant so much to us that it was impossible not to be passionate when we talked about it. So I think my first tip would be start from a place of honesty and passion. What's Maybe your you second tip? That? I'm getting it in order. Oh, okay. I, I, know, I know what it is. I know what my second tip is, but go ahead. I thought you might want to expand. Um... Expand on the passion. No, I absolutely agree. We, um, um, we're working with some filmmakers now who are uh, doing a documentary called Journey Through Fire. And um, they actually came in, and one of the video things that they're doing, which I thought was really nice, is they're uh, talking to different filmmakers and having them almost pitch the film. Where, you know what I mean, what is it that inspired them about the film or what is it that inspires them about the project, which I think again to the passion, that it's not just a filmmaker's passion but to show that the film has inspired a passionate response in others, I think definitely helps in terms of having, you know, testimonials, you know, within the pitch video, which is not something we did. But I saw them doing it um, just well, recently. We, we They're did, working. We did it. different kinds of testimonials. Right, yeah. but you know, for them, it really. Um, I mean, they're still in the, in the in the editing process. They yeah. don't have their film finished yet. You know, we saw rough cuts and little bits and pieces, and you know, found out about the stories and all of that. But um, you know, again, it's speaking to the passion. It's just what's your passion, if. You know, if I'm an audience member and you know you're the filmmaker, of course you're passionate about your project. But to see somebody else get passionate about your project who's not necessarily connected to it in any way, that's intriguing. And then I go, oh, you know, what what is in your project that sparks their passion? Then that may also then spark mine. And I think one one idea that you're hitting on there that I do think is important, if you're lucky enough to have it, is social proof. You know, um, basically proof. That there is a love of your project outside your own love, you know, because of course you love it, or you wouldn't have, you know, spent all your money and all your time making it. We were so lucky to that when we played our initial festivals, that we were not only winning, but we were getting standing ovations, and and we we brought cameras with us to the screenings in hopes of gathering some type of audience reaction. It far exceeded our expectations, but being able to show people our film is receiving one standing ovation after another, and people in the lobby are unable to contain themselves and they're and they're they're crying and talking about the film and this is what real people are saying about the movie I think lent a lot of credibility and it also made people feel good about supporting the film whether it was donating or watching or deciding to buy a ticket it's like well there's other people in the world are being moved by this movie that only says not only says to me that it's good it also says to me this is something I want to be a part of you know am I missing out by not seeing this film is, is it you know would my life you know maybe be touched like that person's life was touched if I took the time to go see it or, or not, not all movies are need to be touching it could be a comedy you know am I gonna have that much fun at the movies you know is, is it worth me going to escape for a few hours so I do think that if you can hint at social proof in any kind of pitch you do for, I, I, for anything just proving that there's there's a more universal uh, you know attractiveness to your project I do think that'll help um, the next point that I think is, is is really important, and I think this speaks to, again, it doesn't matter if you're making a movie, 
if you're selling widgets, you know, if you're you're trying to get booked to give speeches or whatever, I think you have to know your audience. You know, it's really important to know that audience and to speak to them. Um, and and I don't think that necessarily mean a lot of people will go, oh well, who's your audience? And then they'll automatically start breaking it down into demographics. I don't think that necessarily works as well for independent filmmakers. I mean, yes, it's important to know in general, you know, this movie is going to appeal to men more than women or, or vice versa. But a lot of times indie filmmakers fall into this weird in-between place because we're making something that's different and it doesn't necessarily fit one specific mold. So I think you want to figure out how to appeal to certain pieces of everybody. I mean, I think we all have, you know, in the case of Dying to Do Letterman, I think we all have an underdog spirit. No matter who you are, no matter if you're a man or woman, no matter what age you are, all of us at some point in our lives have been the underdog or rooted for an underdog. And that was something we worked really hard to tap into when we, you know, when we reached out. And that was not only reflected in our video, which very clearly said, no one wanted us to make this movie, which was true. People said it, you know, it was a horrible idea to shoot the film. People thought we were crazy to invest our money in it. I mean, we, we were underdogs. Steve's story is a major underdog story. So by saying to people, you know, look, we're underdogs, be part of our underdog story, I think that helped them relate to the movie. I think if you can find something that's universal in your film and, be, and think of that as your demographic. What's my demographic? It's underdogs. We all have a little piece of the underdog in us. So in, in, in a way, it makes it easier to focus your message, like, like you're tapping into that essence as opposed to, I'm just going for the you know 18 to 39 year old male, which probably, if you're an independent filmmaker, you probably don't fit a category quite so sharply, unless you set out to make a commercial film, which is a whole different business plan altogether. So. When we applaud. What's that? <laughs> One oh, more applaud. Applaud. oh, I, I listen. I, uh, I, I, I think yes. Well, that's that's a whole side note. <laughs> I think unfortunately, I think a lot of independent filmmakers get lumped into well you can only make one kind of movie which is not true an independent filmmaker is a person that goes and makes a movie with their own money because no one else will pay for it you know i think that if someone went out and they did their independent version of armageddon god bless them i'd support them 100 percent. i do think there's a bias against you know young aspiring filmmakers who tend to make stuff that appeals to the masses as opposed to niche audiences so for the record i completely support anybody and applaud anybody who, who has the gumption to finish a movie and if your movie happens to be armageddon or a horror movie or a comedy and it doesn't fit your typical, you know, festival festival model. It's I, I don't think people should care. I think you should be applauded for finishing your film in the first place. So that's a whole rant for another day. Do you think that crowdfunding is hurting or even ruining social media? Uh, wow, that's a really really hard question. Uh, Explain it to me a little bit more. I mean, what do you mean? Well, it seems like, you know, it's great to follow people. It's great to be supportive of what they're doing. But when you feel that they've friended you or they've followed you and they're singing your praises and then a week later they let you know about their crowdfunding campaign, it almost feels as if social media has now become more about marketing instead of being social okay um, yes the answer is yes and let me give you an example and I think this is a huge mistake from people making projects you know you can't push it you I mean it's stupid to ask people for money we have never done that in three years actually uh, our friends you know, it's like first thing you do when you make a crowdfunding campaign is just harass your friends like, hey, vote me, give me money, share this. What? I mean, e even with my friends, I tell them, it's like, dude, uh, why? Let me discover it. Let me, I mean, and I'm not going to like it because it's you. I'm going to like it because I like it. So let me discover it. Let me, let me just, you know, give me the opportunity to watch it, but don't ask me to vote you or to give you money because you are you. And that's a huge mistake that can kill a project. So, you know, we, we never push it that way. We just put the project online. And it was funny because our friends, you know, it took like two years for them to give us money. You know, two years when we had been a success in Spain, we've been in, in every media and, and everything, they decided to put money. And, you know, it was amazing because at that point I felt that, that the project was a success you know when even my friends that you know, were tired of listening uh, listen to me talk about the project they decided to get in uh, so I think it's important not to push it and, and you know 
have a, a different idea of what social is and, and what crowdfunding is. It's like make friends and that's okay. And they're gonna help you probably to, to you know to talk about the project. But if you're asking them for money, do it in a different platform or do it or don't do it at all. I mean let the other people talk about you. That's much more powerful. Somebody talks about you. So you have how many days left in the campaign? Thirteen. 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 Okay. Yeah, I think that's why I just tweeted. I better go. Oh, that was fourteen, but. Oh, we'll it see, ends we'll at, at like I three in the morning you. or something. Right. <laughs> Which it be, might as well be thirteen. Yeah. <laughs> so you're you're coming down the home stretch. What are some of the mistakes that you've made, and then what are some of the things that worked that you know you'll continue if you ever go back again? Um, I've been doing a lot of, of reading of people's um, recommendations and a lot of people have said that you should email your uh, social friends before you start the campaign and ask them to help you and I think that's a really good idea and something we didn't do. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'll, like we said before, not having a lot of stuff prepared beforehand just because of the time crunch that mm -hmm. we are under. So we would have loved to have had some video updates sort of pre-shot and edited and ready to go. Um, so that we could just, every Monday we do like a video from a different person or whatever. But, um, so that would, that would be something next time going into it if we have more time. Right. Okay. And, uh, do you find that a lot of people get back to you, uh, if you send emails? No. Okay. <laughs> it's really surprising that no one gets back to you. So, hmm. I don't know what that is. Interesting. Okay. Um, do friends you or like oh, friends. <laughs> I, I mean, talking like newspapers, trying to get uh, newspaper ads. You know, you give people ideas. Do you want you could you could do an article about this? You could do an article about that. Crowdfunding, local girl, um, horror movie, small movie, fifty other things. And well, there's a lot of news in Chico, right. so they don't need your ideas for stories. But we've we've gone we've gone inside and, and found someone who knows someone. So that we're trying that we're right. trying that out for a right. so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think having uh, making contacts with uh, with uh, media outlets beforehand mm -hmm. really would have been helpful yeah. um, hmm. to try to sort of get some media exposure lined up before the campaign. Why? Right. And it's how many days total? We chose thirty. Thirty. Yeah. Okay. Are you happy with that amount, or do you mm -hmm. wish you'd gone? Uh, uh. Um, I believe Kickstarter when they say longer isn't better. So, right. and it's so exhausting and such a huge process. I mean, that sixty-day campaign looks like a nightmare to me. So, yeah. I couldn't imagine. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time to do as it yeah. is a job. So. And it, there's mo so much momentum that you build. I mean, we're it, right in the middle right now, and we're definitely seeing our schlump in the middle that all Kickstarter campaigns have. You have a big, um, in the beginning, you have a, a big, exciting shoot up, and then again at the end, you have another one. So, wow. yeah. mm -hmm. it's like a bell curve. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How would you change the perks of Kickstarter? Well, one of the worst things that Kickstarter perks has, and it's not the model that they build, but how people uh, use it, is that you know, if you pay ten to fifteen or maybe twenty dollars for a DVD on a store, why are you paying thirty for one in Kickstarter? Because what? Because it's an indie project? Because it's you know, what's up with that? Why the minimum amount just to appear in the credits? It's ten dollars or five dollars for a thank you it's like dude I mean look at the market pre-sale if you want but why people I mean why are you making people pay more for and you know if if, if you are if your target audience for the Kickstarter campaign are uh, people that is related to cool and new things that's all right because you know it's like an added value they're gonna they're not gonna you know they're gonna spend it but for normal people, if you want to reach like a broad audience, just pre-sale as, as you were in the market competing to all the people and all the DVDs and all the films. Uh, and at the same time, uh, perks, you know, they give you a lot of work, a lot of work. Uh, and if that's the only way to fund your film, you're not going to fund your film, you know, for the Cosmonaut. Uh, from from strictly crowdfunding like mm, selling merchandise we raised like fifty thousand dollars half of that went to pay for the stock of the things we, you know all the t-shirts and the the mailing and everything else and the other half we have 
on to pay the guys that were making packages for 5,000 people for two years. So in the end, there's no money for the film. You know, we got the real money from investment, from, from crowd investment. You know, people found on the internet that were, uh, you know, buying a percentage of the film. But the rest was just promotion, which is great if you take it that way. It's like, okay, let's promote the film. Let's gonna sell t-shirts because, you know, that's gonna be people wearing a message of the film and telling about it. But to get real money out of that is difficult. John, how often would you say that a filmmaker reaches out to you with, let's say, five days left in their crowdfunding campaign? And you want to help them. So, you mean in terms of reaches out in, in what way? You know, like help my campaign? Pretty much. I get that once a week and I ignore it. You know, it's like, I don't know, if someone's just saying, I ignore, and you know, for better, anyone who just says, oh, John, help me with my crowdfunding campaign. You know, to me, it's like, I don't have a relationship with you. You know, you're reaching out to me when you just want money or you want my help getting you money. It's like, well, you haven't learned anything from any lesson that I've ever t taught. You know, it's like, why, what is the point? What is the, why would I engage with you at that point? You know, if you want to engage with me in advance of that, in any way, shape or form, even to ask me a question on Twitter and seek my advice on something or make a joke or somehow involve me as a person, great. And then you have a crowdfund campaign and you say, hey, John, could you do this because we have a relationship? Sure. But I don't even keep track of how many people say, oh, promote my this, that, or the other thing and I don't have a relationship with them and I ignore it and I feel perfectly fine ignoring it because that person hasn't made the effort to have a relationship with me. It's pretty easy to have a relationship with me, I have to say. You know, I'm pretty busy and sometimes it takes me some days to get back to people and stuff and, you know, it, but generally it's rare that I don't, within a couple of weeks, respond to everything. So, you know, with that being said, if you haven't tried, then you're not really, you know, you're not trying hard enough. So is that, are those things that you love to tell them, but either don't have the time or... Though, yeah, I don't even bother at that point. It's like, you know, it's like, it's just, it's not my job to tell people that I'm not engaging with them when they're asking me to help them make money when they haven't engaged me beforehand, because I say that all the time to people. So you obviously haven't read my book. And so if you haven't read my book, then why are you asking me to help you? So when my book is so cheap and easily available, you know, and uh, even, and generally if you ask me for a free copy, generally I'll give you a free copy. So um, with that being said, <laughs> it's interesting that, you know, people need to remember that, you know, that we're in a, an exchange-based economy or referral-based economy and that, you know, if you want to someone to do something with you, you have to provide them value on some level, you know. And I'm not saying that to be selfish or, you know, you know, demanding or anything like that, but you have to start practicing those muscles or exercise those muscles in order to be successful. And the other thing is if you're coming to me for help in the last five days of your crowdfund campaign, chances are you're too late. Because, and this is the thing about crowdfund campaigns that people don't understand, the way you structure your campaign is how you're, will largely determine how you're, whether you're successful or not. And that goes in terms of how much you ask for, what your rewards are, what your positioning is, what your call to action is, all of that, which is in the structuring of the campaign, will help determine whether you're successful or not. So, and that's why five days before the end of the campaign is most likely too late for any kind of help that I can provide, you know, or I would want to provide, you know. Nicholas, are you able to tell people what the keys are to crowdfunding, or do you feel that, I know we had talked earlier and you said really you can't tell people how to do it, you just don't know how to do it yourself. Yes, you know, it's like, I think it's very 
personal and the, the key for our project you know I can talk about what I think we did right and and I know we did a lot of things that were wrong and the good thing about doing a three-year campaign not a 30-day or a 90-day campaign is that you can try many different things and that's what we did you know many of them were huge failures and, and many of them were successes uh, what I think is I mean the reason I think I you know it's very difficult to advise on how to make a crowdfunding campaign is because I don't think people uh, in something that is related to film or art you know if you're crowdfunding I don't know something physical that you're selling it's like you're selling a product but if you're talking about uh, something arty I think people give you money not because the project but because of you something very personal you know it's like I always say we've we've done two films one of them is the cosmonaut which is you know a science fiction film whatever and the other thing is the story of three guys you know three students willing to make a film and how we told that story over three years with videos and the blog and you know everything we we, we spoke about is what made people engage with us and, and be willing to give us money and if the project had been about anything else it would have been the same that's my guess I'm not sure I might be wrong maybe everyone loves space on the space race but you know it's kind of I think it was about especially the film but the way we talk about it uh, so I guess it, it, it it's you know it, the success of a project will depend on, on the person behind and, and how good he's able to express himself and to pitch yeah. in a way pitch the project so people are investing in you not sort of what you filmed I guess some, you know, some of them is invested in the film itself, and actually there is people that doesn't even know who's behind. You know, it happened to us. It's like, okay, the cosmonaut. I know the cosmonaut. I know that project. I don't know who you are. Oh, okay, I'm the director. Hello. Uh, but you know, I think that comes after. It's like the first people that is going to start talking about you. It's gonna do it because they they like what you're telling them, or the way you're telling them. That I don't know. I might be wrong. It's, it's, I think it's really difficult and you know, there's been like now everyone's doing crowdfunding all the time with, with a thousand projects and not many of them are, are being a success which is sad but I think we are in the beginning of something you know it's like something's gonna grow and, and it needs to adapt you know I think we are living a pretty pretty exciting time uh, and that we have given a huge opportunity as filmmakers to uh, not only because we have a lot of things that we, we didn't have like 15 years ago that allow us, us to make films which is much cheaper and easier and, and all that but because we are in a, in a really in a change of model and, and, and a change of, of, of how the industry works you know at that point where, where everything changes which is what happened you know when the sound uh, came to film or when the new Hollywood and the new world bag arrived that they were you know changing everything how, how it worked and, and we are at that point now I mean we are we are at one of those points that where we are going to define the next 20 or 30 years of film I think it's pretty exciting to be there so related to crowdfunding or creative commons or new distribution models or uh, transmedia uh, I think you know we need to to be mistaken we need to just try things and, and for them to go wrong we need to have a thousand uh, failures in, in crowdfunding to get one success and see and say okay that was the way to go or, or you know uh, it's it's like when 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 you have a success in in anything you know you have a film about magicians and then you have ten films about magicians, uh, so because you know it's a bus and probably the only success is going to be the first one because it was the first one and that's uh, so we need to you know keep doing things and, and keep building and discover what's coming next. So I first discovered your project for Tiny, a story about living small, um, while I was on Kickstarter, and um, tell us about how you began the campaign I know you it was December 2011 or so when you started it or a little yeah, bit I think before? we started it sort of late October and then ended December 15th was our last day okay so what types of things were you doing ahead of time to plan it because you've done a beautiful job at at getting awareness out about it. I mean so many people just they make a video they put it on Kickstarter and then they are very passive about it and it seems like you were all, both very proactive about it what were your strategies either ahead of time or while the campaign was in motion? 
Well, I'll let Ryan answer this one because she's the mastermind, the architect <laughs> yes. of the, okay. of the yeah. Kickstarter campaign. I mean, I think one of the really lucky things about our project is that we had um, sort of the tiny house community there, you know, ready to kind of help us get the word out. And in the tiny house community, you know, there's a really vibrant online community of so many different blogs and Facebook pages and things like that. So I think, you know, before we launched the Kickstarter campaign, we really tried to reach out to to editors of blogs and, um, you know, create personal relationships with people that, you know, could help us get the word out. Um, and so that was, that was one of the ways that we did that. And then um, also reaching out to, you know, anyone else that we thought kind of had a stake in the message that we're trying to get out there. So any kind of environmental blog, you know, design blogs, architecture blogs, um, you know, any, any other subject matter that was touched by this story, we reached out to. And we did a lot of, um, you know, for Film Courage as well, we did a lot of kind of guest blogs and, you know, making sure that we could provide great photos and great content to kind of offer to these people and say, you know, this is the story that we have going on. Use whatever you want, you know, and help us kind of get the word out there. And I think that helped a lot. We got, you know, we ended up getting picked up by I think Oprah.com and, you know, Mother Nature Network and a few bigger blogs that really helped us. Sundance Channel um, blog and the Kickstarter blog actually was mm -hmm. was, was, was huge. Um, so it, it's interesting, Kickstarter itself is, is a platform for um, discovery. I, I mean, I think you found out about us through Kickstarter, but it, just by putting it on Kickstarter, we actually, um, a, a whole new group of people became aware of the project, which was really exciting. Um, but I would definitely, I guess, advise, like if I were to give advice to a, a similar, like an, you know, another indie film that was trying to raise money on Kickstarter, I would definitely suggest that um, don't, do, don't do it right off the bat. You know, wait a little while, um, develop, you know, your plan and make some connections and then also get a lot of the uh, media to accompany your, your campaign, like Mara was saying, with like great pictures and, and videos and um, things like that because it helps sell the story a lot more and and plus if you um, you know show up basically with some stuff that you can can show and point to and say you know we've already you know done this or um, I don't know mm -hmm. you know it it helps people with confidence knowing that it's gonna get made and yeah. Uh, yeah and I think too the message with you know Kickstarter it's it's not necessarily so much you know asking for money it's more about like look at this great thing we're doing that you can be a part of. And so I think it's really kind of tapping into that inspiration factor. And you know, as much as people can kind of do that, I think it will be successful. Mm -hmm. one, one last, uh, <laughs> I guess, uh, piece of advice probably um, is to, so one thing that we did that maybe I would do differently next time is just our rewards. You know, it, we didn't re anticipate how many people would be donating. And so some of our rewards took so much time or, or energy to fulfill that, um, you know, and, and for, for us it was okay because we were still a relatively small um, project and campaign, but for some of the larger films out there, they, you know, they can find that they spend hours, you know, just fulfilling, um, days, <laughs> fulfilling Kickstarter rewards, you know, so um, it's just something to, to keep in mind for filmmakers, I think. Yeah, that's a great point. And I'm wondering too, when things weren't maybe happening or maybe you didn't have days like that, but I know for our campaign, there were days where it was just dead in the water and it's like, okay, time's running out. What did you do to try to drum up noise about the project? I mean, I think, yeah, whenever there was sort of a lull, it would be like, okay, you know, I remember before we started the project or the, the campaign, I wrote down a list of every single blog or you know, mailing list or newsletter or personal contact. I mean, down to like the colleges that we went to, just like the alumni networks. I mean, any any community that I could think of to reach out to and was kind of just crossing them off the list. So if, you know, whenever we hit a lull, I was kind of like, okay, so what new blog can I write? Or, you know, it's helpful because my background is in writing. So it was easy for me to kind of like figure out a new angle and, and write a blog. but. Um, you know, it was kind of just like, okay, what, what else can I put out there just to keep putting stuff out? Yeah, I think definitely the plan about, you know, having a regular um, sort of schedule of, of blogs. So even if we knew that in advance that there would be four or five blogs that were already willing to either write about us or let us do a guest um, blog, we would 
you know, say, okay, well, can we do it this day because we didn't want to have five come out in one day and then have a week where there wasn't any. So we tried to pace it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's important to remember too that it's, it's great to, you know, start small. I mean, a lot of the press coverage that we got, you know, started off being really small kind of local blogs and newsletters that, you know, someone would see it and be like, oh, that's cool. And then they write about it for their thing and it kind of got, you know, would, the, the reach became greater and greater, but we started pretty small. And I think, you know, it's not like you need to have a contact with the New York Times in order to, you know, make a successful campaign. You can, you can start with who you know. Sure. What about for people, though, that maybe either aren't willing to write or aren't a skilled writer, such as yourself? I mean, a lot of people approach us, and I think sometimes they're afraid because they know people might read it and they don't know if it'll come across correctly or, you know. What would you say to someone that has that fear of writing? We've dealt with so many people like that. I mean, I would say that there's, there, there's more ways than just words to tell a story. So, I mean, if someone's really visual or, you know, maybe someone could like do a cartoon or I don't know. I mean, there's so many different ways to get a message across that doesn't have to necessarily be in the written word. I mean, it could be music or, you know, mm -hmm. just really kind of using creativity to think of different methods. I mean, if they're filmmakers, presumably they could do video blogs or <laughs> something like that. Um, but I would also say that I think any film is going to be enhanced by having a good writer attached to it. Um, so it's almost worth, I mean, you know, maybe they don't have access to a writer at the moment, but that's kind of something that I would think about in advance. It's just like, okay, well, there's going to be a lot of things that need to be written, you know, from the script to blogs to um, promotional materials. You know, it's, it's good to have at least somebody you can rely on if, if you're not comfortable doing that. Yeah. And of your under 200 backwards, it was like, what, 90, 196 or something like that? Were they people that you knew? Were they from your college or were they family and friends or who were they? I'd say maybe like maybe 20 to 30 percent were people that we knew, you know, either friends who gave sort of like $10 a piece or family members who were able to give a little bit more. Um, but I'd say, I mean, a good bulk of the people who donated, I think, were either part of the tiny house community or um, were excited for environmental reasons or had kind of found us, you know, through one of those blogs. Yeah. I, I mean, I might even be kind of a high estimate. Yeah. I, I'm, it's hard to say, but maybe 20 to 30% of them, maybe 20% of the money I think might have been from people we know because people we knew, um, we had a few large donations from, you know, family or something like that. But I, I don't know. I mean, I think. I was surprised at how many people we didn't know, yeah. you know, honestly. And I mean, it's, strangers who were backing sort of higher levels, which I never expected, right. you know, to have a stranger sort of back at the $500 level or something like that. Mm -hmm. which is, yeah. yeah, really, it was really great. And, yeah. and from all over the world, Australia, lots of people from Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I know it was, it was nice. And, you know, the interesting thing is when we first launched the Kickstarter campaign, that was, we had 300 fans on Facebook or something like that. And, and just as a gauge of, we, we were relatively still new um, as a project and and if we had even waited six months from that point I think it, it would have been a different story you know as far as we would have had even more people we didn't know you know because um, yeah it's all about I mean it's amazing what you can do with the internet really. mm -hmm. do you think people realize how hard crowdfunding is I mean it's Kickstarter and Indiegogo they're such sexy sites and they see these beautiful trailers do you think people just think oh I'll just put this up and then Strangers from all over the world will find my project. I think that's exactly what people think, and they're wrong. <laughs> and a lot of those, if people do that, then they, you see a lot of things that don't, that don't make their goal. Like, what was it? You found a great one. They I had found like this great project that I, I backed, that. and I tweeted about it, and I went back a couple of days later, and they didn't have any more backers. And I went back a couple of weeks later, and they didn't have any more backers. And I was like, that means to me that they didn't even put in the effort to con their friends into backing <laughs> their project, which means that maybe they should look into how crowdfunding works some more and try again, because it's almost a full-time job. Yeah. There's a lot of refreshing of the, the web page. This is our second <laughs> Kickstarter. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yeah, and uh, our first one um, was definitely a full-time job, and, and so is this one. It's, it's really hard, and you have to do a lot of research, and you have to do a lot of contacting people and blogs and you know newspapers and things that aren't ever going to contact you back, but you have to contact them anyway. <laughs> and, just in um, case. Just in case. Yeah. And it's, it's very difficult, and you have to have 
a, a base to start with too. Um, I read somewhere that you know, your number of Facebook friends is directly proportional to how well your Kickstarter does. And Facebook um, is definitely the number one source for our pledges. So, yeah. Um, since last year, Kickstarter put in a great new uh, dashboard, and you can see where everything's come from, coming from. So that's a great time waster too, because you can look at that and be like, oh, so, you know, thirty-seven percent from Twitter. I, I better tweet more. So right. Mostly, it's just trying to get the word out and trying to get people to repost it, retweet, um, and that sort of thing. Because that's it's really eyeballs getting eyeballs mm -hmm. on the project, on the on the video. Because if they like the video, then then that could push and, them over. And explaining to people that even if you don't have money to pledge, which I totally understand, sharing it is worth something. Yes. If you tweet it, if you Facebook it, and then if you do that again in a couple days, that really helps the people. And uh, I do that a lot with projects that I'm, I'm not going to back. I'll share them because I think they're wonderful and I want them to happen. So. And having new content to post so that you're not posting the same thing over and over again really helps. We were a little pressed for time with this, uh, with this one. Um, we would have preferred to have had a couple of different videos ready to go so we could, you know, release them. Uh, we did a second video after with Barry Bostwick, who's in the movie. That was that was a lot of fun. Um, and we have a couple written, but, uh, you know, it's been hard to line people's schedules up. So it would have been nice um, if we were smart. To, 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 have <laughs> to plan more time. Yeah, to have yeah. had the whole campaign But we had to pull the trigger because of the timing of our, of our first screening. So. Yeah. Yeah. so what do you found has been the biggest uh, draw besides Facebook, to getting people that are outside your social circle, family and friends, to donate? What's been the best approach? Well, for our last Kickstarter, we were very lucky to get a lot of blog attention, and that definitely was what Yeah, um, every time we, we got were featured on a new blog, like Boing Boing or Nerdist or uh, Laughing Squid, Gizmodo, Gizmodo, Laughing Squid, it would just, it would just surge because it was, um, it was eyeballs on it that hadn't seen it before and that people were excited about the idea. And it also had the uh, legitimacy of an outside source saying, mm -hmm. hey, look at this thing, as opposed to... The person themselves. Yeah. Right. Hey, look at me over here. Yeah. Um, so that really, really helped. Um, and uh, in terms of not having the, the same sort of media attention, having Barry Bostwick mm -hmm. uh, retweet, and, or he does not, doesn't have a Twitter, but uh, uh, Facebooking, yeah. sharing the, the video that he did really helped. Neil Gaiman shared it, which was helpful. Yeah. Um, Simon Helberg, who's in the movie, shared it, which is helpful. And uh, just having anyone share it is helpful. <laughs> anyone with reach. We, yeah. uh, we had a, a little article in the Nerdist uh, today. Mm -hmm. and, and there was uh, a definite little bump. And there's bump. been a, yeah. a bump today that, that really went along with that. Mm -hmm. We were featured uh, and we did an interview on the Nerdist on Friday that, land, that landed and, uh, and that gave us a little bit of a bump as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just about getting the word out and yeah. uh, people, people hearing your message and hopefully liking what you have to say. Well what sounds good in theory but then it actually didn't work too well. Huh. Okay. Um, well, I'll look at the Kickstarter and, oh gosh, there hasn't been a pledge for four hours, and I'll go and, and do a lot of social media and nothing happens. So it's really hard to know what does What's work. What's working, yeah. Um, what else doesn't work? Uh, what else doesn't work? Oh, I sent an email to every single person uh, from that is on my Facebook from my hometown. And I, people just don't read Facebook messages is part of it. But I think I got one response. <laughs> so that, you know, people say personal um, appeals, but I think emails may be better than Facebook messages. Right. Phone calls. Phone calls, yeah. okay. Yeah. Text messages. Yeah. Explaining to your grandmother how to open her email so she can share it with her friends. Right. <laughs> Do you think there are certain times of day that are more receptive to tweets? I mean, I know Dave has always said five o'clock seems like a good time. Is that yeah? Getting off and work? and I notice in the morning too, um, which is terrible. You have to get up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> we like to work late. Yeah, um, that's the problem too. Is a lot of times three a.m. I'm tweeting and Facebooking up a storm and nobody cares. Sure. So. Well, there's people in. Germany. Yeah. Or, yes. Yeah. Yes. Our foreign fan base. Iceland. Or we have yeah. we have fans in Indonesia. So. That's true. Oh, cool. yeah. That's true. The, very cool. the film is played there. Mm -hmm. So, nice. mm -hmm. John, can you give us a few reasons why people succeed at crowdfunding? Um. Whew. You know, I'd say the easiest blanket statement would be because they set up their project properly, you know, and they strategized it well, and they, you know, 
it, 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 what people need to think about is that crowdfunding is very much like making a film, you know, that it's a lot of prep, you know, and all the, the more work you do in the prep, it's going to benefit you in production. That if you prep properly, the production will be much smoother. And if you don't prep properly, you're going to be scrambling, you know, and then there's post, you, there's the follow through. So, um, you know, I think being realistic about who your audience is and how much of an audience you have and making that, you know, sync with your goal. Um, and then also thinking about your audience and potentially what they'd want from you in terms of rewards and, um, and providing those in a create and providing creative and interesting rewards, you know, having a compelling, um, call to action and compelling video and being personable and, and, um, and, and then, you know, working it or, you know, having enough people on board to help work it during the campaign, you know, and that's, you know, what I would say, you know. Do you think people can take their social media as a collective of the project and kind of break it down and say, well, I'm assuming if we have X amount of Facebook followers, X amount of Twitter followers, realistically, we're going to be able to get this much. I mean, works? I think you have to be very pessimistic, you know, and, and really look at um, uh, conventional online conversion, you know, and online conversion is, you know, at best 1%. So, you know, which is very, so if you have 10,000 followers, say, which I almost do say, so I have 8,000 followers on Twitter, and I, if I convert 1% of those to even look at my Kickstarter page, Right, so what is 1% of 10,000? You know, I'm a math guy, so 10% uh, is 1,000, so 1% 1 is 100. Not much, right? So if I get, if I do a 1% conversion from my followers, so that's 100. And if I get 1% of those people to then convert from the conversion, because the, the first conversion is the click, the second conversion is the buy, that's one person out of my 10,000 followers who are going to contribute. Now, I think I'm probably going to do better than that, but if I really want to be conservative, that's what you're looking at. So, yes, you can use your followers, but you have to be very conservative about what, realistic about who you're going to convert. Now, I probably, you know, will have a higher conversion rate because I feel like you know, I like to, I feel like I followed my, you know, 80, 20 rule in that, you know, I feel like I provide a lot of value to my followers and I think I've maybe engendered goodwill amongst them. I like to think. Um, and so, and I know there's certain people that I can call on to act, you know, and I've contributed to campaigns, etc. So, you know, I think, you know, you have to, so it's not an easy calculation. Let me just put it that way. It's not just saying, oh, I have 8,000 people, so 8,000 people will contribute or 4,000 will contribute and Kickstarter says the average is $70. So then 4,000 times 70 is is $40,280,000. So I'm gonna set my goal at, I'm gonna be conservative and set my goal at 200,000. You know, that's crazy town. You know, you're not, that's, it's not gonna work like that.